In 1015 AD, in southern Norway, a local chieftain had a son and named him Harald. Later, he would be known as Harald Hardrada. From birth as a Norse nobleman, Harald was always destined to be a soldier. He was the half-brother of the Norwegian king, Olaf II, and a soldier he would definitely become. Harald left his mark on lands as far apart as Denmark and Jerusalem, and he claimed the thrones of no less than three nations over the course of his life. But what exactly did he do to achieve his reputation as one of the Vikings' greatest leaders, and their last? How was it that he managed to amass power in Norway and abroad, and why did his final expedition end in catastrophe? In short, just who was Harald Hardrada? Well, Scandinavia's warriors, fierce Viking raiders, were once the scourge of Europe, but by the time of Harald Hardrada's birth, the raiding had begun to die down. Other Europeans started to better defend themselves, and Norse economies at home had become more developed. Many Scandinavians, including Harald's family and the king, had also adopted the religion of their former victims, Christianity. That said, they retained a drive for conquest, take the most powerful of their leaders during Harald's childhood, Canute the Great, who ruled over England in addition to his native Denmark. Canute was also responsible for ending Harald's childhood. The young Hardrada was steadfastly loyal to his half-brother and king, and in 1030, aged just 15, he defended Olav's crown at the Battle of Stiklestad against Canute. The Dane was in the process of seizing the country. Harald is said to have fought at Stiklestad with distinction, but he couldn't save Olav or Norway from the invaders. Harald's brother died in battle, and Canute added Norway to his collection of crowns. Olav II was canonized shortly afterwards. Today, he's Norway's patron saint, but Harald was forced to flee. With him gone, Canute the Great was left free to consolidate his control over Norway and govern his North Sea Empire. Within about a year of his exile, Harald arrived in the Kievan Rus, basically the earliest version of modern Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. There, he served the Prince of Kiev, Yaroslav the Wise. Even at a young age, it was clear that the future Hardrada had an advanced understanding of warfare, and also the charisma to lead men. He was made a captain under Yaroslav, and for a time fought for him against Poland. Harald would later send plunder to be stored with the Rus in Kiev, and would marry Yaroslav's daughter. But he would really earn the fame, and more importantly, the money, that he needed to retake Norway by fighting not for the Rus, but for the much more wealthy Byzantine Empire to the south. Harald was not the first Scandinavian to seek his fortune serving the emperors of Constantinople. In fact, the elite Varangian Guard, a force composed of Norsemen, but also Rus and later Anglo-Saxons, had been operating as shock troops and personal guards for the Byzantine emperors since the 9th century. The Varangians were valued for their loyalty. As foreigners, they weren't invested in the political squabbles that plagued the Byzantine court. Norse culture also emphasized the importance of one's word and duty to a lord, making the average Varangian entirely willing to lay down his life to protect the emperor. Of course, there were also other, shinier incentives for their service. The Byzantine Empire at its height was richer than what most European nobles could conceive of in their wildest dreams, and their capital, Constantinople, was the largest city in the Christian world, and it wasn't particularly close. To Harald, used to relatively small Norway and Kiev, Constantinople, or Miklagard as the Norse called it, would have seemed otherworldly. It also presented him with the opportunity to turn his talent for warfare into cold hard cash. Most of what we know about Harald's life with the Byzantines comes from the Icelandic scholar Snorri Sturluson, who wrote the first summarized history of the Norwegian kings, the Heimskringla, which contains the saga of King Harald. Sturluson also recorded the Prose Edda, which today is the world's primary source on Norse mythology, and he wrote in Old Norse in a time when almost anything important in Europe was written down in Latin. It was Sturluson who gave Harald the epithet Hardrada, roughly meaning the hard ruler, the severe, or the tyrannical in Old Norse. So according to Sturluson, in approximately 1034, Harald and around 500 men loyal to him from Norway and Rus entered the service of the Byzantine Empress Zoe Porphyrogenita as Varangians and were sent to quell piracy in the Aegean Sea. 
There, Harold's prowess won him the respect of his fellow guardsmen, and he took command of the Varangians. For the next eight years, he fought for the Byzantines across most of the Mediterranean, and in doing so, made himself a fortune. Primarily, Harold fought to reassert Byzantine authority in Sicily and against the Berber Muslims of North Africa, meaning that he had a large army at his disposal in one of the wealthiest places on the planet. Naturally then, he made his Viking forefathers proud and plundered the lands of Constantinople's enemies, seizing castle after castle and massacring anyone who attempted to resist. The loot he acquired, in addition to his pay from the Empress, was all safely sequestered in Kiev. From North Africa, Harold made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, where he visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the empty tomb of Christ, and bathed in the River Jordan, all while asserting Byzantine authority over the Holy Land. From there, he returned to Constantinople and was sent to squash Bulgarians rebelling against the Byzantines in about 1041. It was around then that he learnt that Canute the Great had died a few years previously, and his North Sea Empire had collapsed. So, likely with the intent of going to take his homeland by force, Harold ended his contract with the Byzantines. Something that made the Empress Zoe just a bit unhappy, and Harold briefly found himself imprisoned before escaping and making his way back to Kiev. There he married Elisovata Yaroslavana, or Elisif of Kiev, the daughter of Yaroslav the Wise. Whether she actually made it back to Norway with him isn't known though, and all his sons were born to another wife. Harold certainly had his plunder though, and with it he made his way north to the Baltic and eventually to Norway. With Canute out of the way, the Norwegians had put Olaf II's son, Magnus the Good, on the throne, and it's possible that Harold didn't love the idea of waging war on his nephew. So instead, he made a deal with Magnus. In exchange for him recognizing Harold as co-king of Norway, Harold agreed to share his wealth from abroad. It also helped that he had an ace up his sleeve. In addition to Norway, Magnus also ruled Denmark, and Harold had aligned himself with a Danish nobleman, Sven Estridsson, who had been trying to seize Magnus's lands there. With him backing Harold, Magnus had no real choice but to concede the co-kingship. Now in power, Harald Hardrada immediately turned on his former ally, Sven. With Magnus, he campaigned against him in Denmark, and in 1047, he got the Norwegian kingship to himself when Magnus died there of an illness. However, just to show that he hadn't forgiven Harald for his earlier usurpation, Magnus left Denmark, not to him, but to Sven, and that finished off any friendship that might have been between the Norwegian and the Dane. For nearly the next 20 years, Harald split his time between governing Norway and doing his damnedest to conquer Denmark. That consisted of raiding the Danish coast, which to be honest is most of Denmark, and that was something that Harald was quite good at given his experience with the Byzantines. However, despite winning several battles, he never managed to dislodge Sven. Notably, he won at Nyssa in 1062, the battle involved a total of at least 400 ships, and it might have seen Harald finally take Denmark, if not for the fact that most of the Danes, including Sven himself, ran away to fight another day, rather than being captured or killed by Harald. With it clear then that neither one was going to defeat the other, Harald and Sven at last agreed to an unconditional truce, and Harald returned to Norway. There, he implemented a number of domestic reforms, and importantly, he removed the right of local chiefs to maintain standing armies, or the herd, thus centralizing power in the hands of the king. Though Harald had given up on Denmark, the ghost of the North Sea Empire still loomed over Scandinavia. Magnus was the one who came the closest to restoring it, and he had planned to reconquer England before his death. His grounds were based on a treaty he had signed with the son of Canute the Great and the last Dane to rule England, Harthacanute. Canute. It stipulated that should either of them die without an heir, the other would inherit his lands, and that's actually how Magnus got Denmark in addition to Norway. But in England, after Harthacanute's Canute's death, the native Anglo-Saxons, led by the powerful Earl Godwin of Wessex, took the opportunity to depose the Danes and placed an Anglo-Saxon, Edward the Confessor, on the throne. For most of Edward's reign, he was caught in a power struggle with Godwin, and after 1053, the Earl's son Harold and his brothers. Magnus probably would have invaded England himself, if not for the trouble Sven was causing in Denmark and the return of Harold to Norway. He certainly threatened Edward the Confessor with war, but little more than raids actually came of that. 
When Magnus died, though, Harald maintained the Norwegian claim to England, and his peace with Sven in 1064 gave him the freedom to press it. Now, he just needed an opportunity, something that would knock the Anglo-Saxons off balance, and he didn't have to wait long to get one. When Edward the Confessor died childless in 1066, he continued the medieval world's long tradition of not leaving a clear successor to his lands. Three men claimed the throne. One was obviously Harold Hardrada. Another was Harold, that's Harold with an O, the son of Godwin, who was the most powerful earl in the country, and so was chosen by England's nobles to be king. And the last was Duke William of Normandy, Edward's cousin, who had claimed that he had promised him the throne. Edward's death alone wasn't enough to provoke Harold to leave Norway, though. Godwinson was a good choice by the English for king. Really, he was the only choice. Thanks to their father's work, he and his brothers had an iron grip on the country, and the prospect of launching an invasion was daunting. What changed? Disunity. Harold Godwinson indicted his younger brother Tostig for treason right after he became king and stripped him of his lands in Northumbria. Tostig, wanting them back, went to Denmark to appeal to King Sven for help, who said no, so he went to Norway. Harald Hardrada had believed that even if he could land in England, he could never control it, as the local population would reject him as it had Magnus, but with Tostig, a prominent Anglo-Saxon by his side, that might not have been the case. So a plan was hatched. Harold and Tostig would invade England together, starting with Northumbria. There, Tostig would rally his old subjects behind him to support the Norwegian cause against his brother, and he also promised that he could gain the support of Malcolm III of Scotland. With their combined might, Harold would take England and make Tostig his vassal. Is that what ended up happening, though? Not exactly. Harold absolutely sailed for England. He left Norway in April with a fleet of about 300 ships and stopped along the way at the islands of Shetland and Orkney, then a part of Norway. There, Tostig's Scottish allies came through, and Malcolm III provided the Norwegians with about 2,000 more soldiers. In September, Harold met Tostig at Tynemouth, and they began to raid the northern English coast. Tostig's replacement in Northumbria and the Earl of Mercia marched out to meet them, but were beaten back with relative ease. Things were looking good, and on top of that, Harold Godwinson had the bulk of the English army all the way south in London, having made the mistake of believing the Norman invasion to be more imminent than Harold Hodrada's. That said, he did manage to march his army nearly 200 miles north in just four days. Obviously, they were exhausted, but the Anglo-Saxon speed gave them the advantage of surprise, and Godwinson fell upon Harold Hardrada and Tostig's camp at Stamford Bridge in the early morning of September 25th. His first attack went poorly. Godwinson's cavalrymen struggled to deal with entrenched Norwegian spears, but then, sensing weakness in the English, Harold ordered his men to break formation and charge. That boldness might have once served him well. It did not at Stamford Bridge. Out in the open, the Anglo-Saxons began to slaughter the Norwegians, and their leader, King Harald Hardrada, victor of so many battles and leading from the front, was taken down by an arrow to the throat. Godwinson would offer mercy to those who would surrender to him, but at least according to the sagas, Harold's Vikings refused the quarter of the Englishmen who had slain their warrior king. In the aftermath of Stamford Bridge, Harold Hardrada and Tostig were both dead. Norsemen would never again rule in England, and only about 20 ships of Harold's original fleet returned to Norway. Harald Hardrada did get some revenge from beyond the grave, though. Just three weeks after the Vikings' final battle, Harald Godwinson and his remaining brothers were killed by William of Normandy's invading army at the Battle of Hastings. Like Harald Hardrada, William was a conqueror at heart, so you may want to see how he governed his new kingdom. If so, you can check out the video to the left, and as always, I've been James, and I'll see you there.